Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our morning service here at Brian Baptist Church. We're so glad to have each and every one of you here. It has been a busy morning, um, not just killing flies and spiders. We've been doing that all morning as well. It's like flies and spiders knew the church was unoccupied, and so they've multiplied. And so we've had fly swatters and all sorts of things going in the early service. Uh, my thanks to Brother Glenn Miller, who killed two flies. Uh, for those of you on Facebook Live, if you're fly friendly, I'm so sorry. But, um, but I have people that don't like them, and so we're taking care of them right now. And so anyway, we had an 8.45 a.m. service, and that was nearly a full house. We have a full house. And what I mean by a full house, I mean the state-mandated requirement of 25 people in a building. And so that's where we're at in phase one. Uh, but we're still excited. We're happy to be together. So we're going to start by singing. And, um, you know, you can make your church home a little piece of heaven. And so we're going to sing number 510, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. <clears throat> number 510. And so I'm going to have everybody who can have you stand if you want to. And that's 510 in the gray book. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. And on Facebook Live, feel free to sing with us if you want to. Let's sing together. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows was telling with joy I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me all. My sins were washed away. And my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with light from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully with Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made When as a sinner I came Took the offer of grace He did proffer He saved me Oh, praise His dear name Heaven came down And glory filled my soul When at the cross The Savior made of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day, when at the cross I believe, which is eternal and blessing supernal, from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Came down and glory filled my soul. I'm going to give you the blue book ending. Here we go. Heaven came down and glory just testing whether whether the people at the 8 45 a.m service whether they can hit the high note better than the people at the 11 o'clock service what do you think 
And so good to have each and every one of you here today. If you're joining us live, uh, uh, what is going on is we're now open uh, for phase one reopening. To our church congregation, we're going to begin in a word of prayer, but let me talk to you about this. Lord willing, we're make, there, because we're now in phase one reopening, I guarantee our county commissioners are already planning for phase two reopening. And, and um, our, um, our state fire marshal is, is uh, getting inquiries literally to measure uh, Catholic churches all over the region and it appears that they're preparing for a percentage reopening, maybe even as much as 50%. And see, 50% uh, occupancy in this room is, 100% uh, occupancy in this room is 192. So if we're at 50%, I'm, I'm okay with that. And so the earliest that would take place would be the 7th of June, but that is what we're hoping for. And once that happens, then everything, except for social distancing, everything uh, begins to take on a semblance of normalcy and that we're able to uh, restart our shuttle ministries, able to reactivate our Sunday school program. For those this morning, and maybe you're watching again just to see if I preach the same message the same way the second time, uh, for those of you that are doing that, um, uh, what I'm saying, and I know you may already be sad. You may go, I really liked early service. Well, once we get back to regular schedule, we'll just be at 11 o'clock service again. But um, we already, uh, we already have had a record attendance in the month of May, and it beat the April attendance as well. And of course, I'm saying that tongue in cheek. It is, it is the largest attendance that will exist in this building since March 15th, and so. I'm having a good day because guess what? I get to see all of you. Now, you don't all get to see each other because then you have to funnel out groups of 25, but I get to see all of you, so I'm having a really good day. So, by the way, this, this face mask thing. This face, okay, just before you pray, Kevin, come up here and stand on the stage, okay? Listen, God has given men face masks already. You see, look right there, you see? See, there's already a way. I mean, it's already nature by nature. God has already created face masks in mankind. Uh, Thomas, I'm not giving you a motivation to start. Vicky, you either. Okay, thank you. You may go back. And, uh, <clears throat> and so all you have to do is duct tape his mouth and he'd be perfectly safe. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, well, you know that breathing in, breathing out, speaking thing. You know, those viruses, they can leap tall buildings at a single bound. So not really. So don't start a rumor. Let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your house and worship you together. And we pray that you would encourage us through the power of your word, the presence of your Holy Spirit, and in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we come here because we believe in you. And we, we have faith and we believe that you are on your throne and that let every... It says, let God be found true and every man a liar. And man can say whatever he wants to, but what you say is the truth, even in these troubled days. So we pray that you would encourage us through the presence of your Holy Spirit and through your working in our midst this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're going to turn into the song's name is Satisfied. And it's 518 in the songbook, number 518. And it talks about what Jesus did. Hallelujah. I have found him. <clears throat> so let's sing this song together. All my life long I had planted For a drink from some cool spring That I hoped would the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long had prayed. Jesus satisfies my longings through its blood I now am saved. Feeding on the husks around me Till my strength was almost gone Long my soul for something better 
shelter only still to wander on hallelujah i have found him who my soul so long has prayed jesus satisfies my longings through what i now am saved for what I was and sought for riches something that would satisfy but the dust I gathered round me only mocked my soul sad cry hallelujah I have found him who my soul so long has prayed Jesus despise my longings through his blood I now am saved. Well of water ever springing, bread of life so rich and free, untold wealth that never faileth, my Redeemer is to me. Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long has prayed. Jesus satisfies my longings. Through his blood I now am saved. And what a wonderful thing it is to be saved because if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit of God residing in you. You have that sweet <coughs> Holy Spirit residing in you and the wonderful thing is then you can get together with god's people those that are saved they have god's holy spirit residing in them together you can feel a connection you can feel a, kin a kinship and then what you have is a sweet spirit provided you didn't come grumpy you didn't come grumpy this morning you you can have a sweet spirit together and that's what this song is all about sweet sweet spirit number 391 in the gray songbook a 391 and you know if you have a sweet spirit we gather together it creates a sweet spirit in the house of God and so let's sing about that right now there's a sweet sweet spirit in this place and I know that it's the spirit time the morning crowd knew that song some of you are going i don't know about this so we're going to go through it one more time here we go there's a sweet sweet spirit in this place and i know that it's the spirit of the lord there are sweet
Amen. Wonderful singing. Time for the announcements. And you go, now for the church calendar. You go, Pastor, we have a church calendar. Actually, um, I things are in the works <clears throat> and in the offing, in the planning. And so um, it's not all gloom and doom. And so we're beginning to open things up, uh, beginning to put things on the calendar. The first thing is, <coughs> excuse me, the Skeen family. Hold it. This <coughs> Marco Rubio moment is brought to you by. Oh, isn't that good? Anybody else thirsty? I'm so glad. I'm so sad you don't have a bottle of water right now. Okay, we'll move on right now. Uh, let me talk about this. Mar uh, May 31st. May 31st. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan Skeen, Jonathan Katrina Skeen, the entire Skeen family is coming uh, to Brian Baptist Church. Now, at that point, we will still be on this current schedule, but uh, they will be here for Sunday morning, uh, Sunday school, uh, the later Sunday morning service. And then uh, my goal is to have an outdoor service on Sunday night with the Skeen family. And so uh, just letting you know, kind of giving you an advance, kind of what we're looking to do. So what you do on May 31st, pray for no rain. Yeah, no rain on May 31st. I really would like to have outdoor service Sunday night, outdoor service on May 31st. The Skeens will be with us the entire time. By the way, next week is Memorial Day weekend. Don't forget that. Uh, don't forget to come dress up red, white, and blue. You know, we love this nation. We can tell some don't love it as much as we do, but... We love our country, we love the United States of America, and we are grateful for men and ladies, our military, our armed services, people who gave their lives for this country. And so Memorial Day weekend on the 24th, 31st is, uh, of course, the Skeens. Lord willing, the following Sunday, we should be into phase two. And phase two, as I said, looks a whole lot more hopeful. Uh, looks like uh, we may be able to return to kind of our normal schedule. And so I will still have some social distancing practices. Now, because of that, if you follow the clockwork, then after June 26, we're in phase three. And so you may be going, Pastor, what are we going to do about the I Love America conference? Here's my answer. We're having the I Love America conference. It's going to take place. We're going to have it. As a matter of fact, it may be an encouragement to preachers all over the region because it will be probably the very first preaching conference in the region since the shutdown. And so if we can encourage some people, we're going to do that. Uh, we may have to follow uh, some slightly different protocols, and I'm trying to get all the answers uh, regarding that. <coughs> but my plan and uh, Brother Brad Wells' plan, our plan is still full steam ahead. And so, anyway, um, I've been hearing about from Brother Olette, and uh, Brother Olette um, uh, made the statement, right now, Sunday morning, uh, oh, Sunday afternoon now, he's done, but he's preaching in Ohio today. I guess Ohio has enough opening that he doesn't have to do Facebook or live stream. He actually can preach to real living, breathing people, and so he's happy about that. But please pray for the preachers in Washington State. Um, you thought it was bad here. Um, very difficult in Washington State, very difficult in California. And do pray regarding the lawsuit that was uh, put forth. It was put forth on Thursday, uh, challenging the governor on three, on, on three declarations she's made, challenging her saying uh, they are neither lawful nor constitutional. Um, and some of those, not just unconstitutional on First Amendment, right, to assemble, uh, not to in, infringe the freedom of worship. We already know about that, but um, one of the challenges is a violation of the Oregon Constitution. And so, so just pray regarding this. Uh, pastors and churches were trying to open. Uh, we have a command of Almighty God to assemble. And, you know, that's even a higher law than any law that man has ever written. And if you follow things, you may notice that in in Russia and in Romania, uh, you know what? When the government told them they couldn't assemble, they still did. And at that time, America was going, yay, yay, they're assembling good people, religious freedom. And uh, in China, the same thing, yay, yay, Chinese, 
Yes, practice that American freedom. And now today, don't meet, don't meet, don't assemble. No, um, if you think something weird's going on, you're right. Something really weird is going on. But um, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And so it's important that we do things God's way. And so just continue to pray. Pray for one another. Uh, when I met for the men for men's prayer, I said, get out, your, get out your directory and pray for every man in the church. And I said, at least won't they pray for me? Listen, you got, if you have husbands, the wives can pray for you, that type of thing. But uh, we need the men praying for the men, okay? Because they have families and they have children and they have wives. And, and so it's important that we continue uh, we continue to pray. So remember those things and, and remember this. Also this, encourage you to use this time to reach out with the gospel. I was telling you um, on Wednesday about a uh, missionary to Israel. He can't go back to Israel right now, but he mailed out tracts. He mailed out tracks. He called him on the phone and said, I'm mailing you a track. They get the track. He calls on the phone. Did you get the track? Let's talk about it. And he led six people to Christ on the telephone <clears throat> because of that there's a way to do it uh we had a teenager um um that uh, uh jared knew a friend of jared's and and micah um Mika prayed and and he received christ this teenage boy received christ middle of the week this week too don't think it's all done and over it quite the opposite is true and uh, we're already trying to figure out a way to maybe get these indoor hangers and just start hanging them all over town so well, we're working on things, and we'll continue to work on things, and and uh, just keep moving ahead. And you know what? Don't be scared at sitting in a restaurant. Find a restaurant with golden arches and sit at the table, and uh, <clears throat> you know, and say, "I sat at a restaurant today." My wife and I did that this weekend, the day of the opening. We found an open restaurant. Roosters, why aren't you open yet? We found a, a restaurant that was open. Sisters is open, okay? And they have really good sandwiches. We went there. We sat at a table, and we had a sandwich, and we had a time, and uh, we weren't even scared about one single little coronavirus floating around. <coughs> scared. They can't leap tall buildings at a single bound. And uh, anyway, I have a lot more to say about that, but then I'd be into my sermon, so I can't tell you that yet. So <coughs> let's turn to number 526 by the way um there's the offering plate is on the pulpit we'll, uh i know we're not passing the plate once we get to um phase two we will start passing the plate again but i just want you to know yeah it's still there and it's calling your name and um <clears throat> but uh, also let you know this uh, continue to give to the ramp project we need just twelve hundred dollars to be completely finished up with the stucco coat inside where the ramp is and then we can put the rails back on and hopefully have that thing in full operation uh by the 7th of june and so anyway uh, grateful it's about 90 percent done right now and grateful for that okay 526 on christ the solid rock i said hey stand it says let's stand <coughs> and sing this together my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest way, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When Darkness fails his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy veil, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, His covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is 
sinking sand. His sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, pressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. If you have your Bibles, please remain standing and turn to the book of 1 John, the book of 1 John chapter 1. We stand out of respect for God's word, just like they did in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8, when the, the nation of Israel, they all came as one man. It means they all came together completely unified in purpose, unified in goal, and they said, bring out the book of the law. And they stood up while the book of the law was read, looking in the book of First John, the book of First John this morning, and one more time, please look with me as I read the first few verses of the book of First John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Let us have a word of prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bring to light your word before us right now. We know that you breathe your word. We know it is inspired by you. We know that it is forever settled in heaven and indeed was settled in heaven long before it was even imparted to earth. We know this to be the case. And right now, Lord, we live in a dark day, an unusual day, a trying day. But we confess before you by the authority of your word that in you is found no darkness at all. So help us to take strength. Help us to have hope. Help us to gain perspective through your word this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to go back in history a little bit. I want to take you prior to this crisis. I want to take you prior to the war on terror. I want to take you prior to Afghanistan. I want to take you prior to what actually is the second Iraq war and take you to the very first Iraq war, the 100-day war, the liberating of Kuwait, what we call the Operation Desert Storm, I want to take you back to a time such as this. You're talking about around 1989, 1990. I'm taking you back to that time, and I'm going to take you to an evening newscast. The evening newscast is the CBS Evening News, and the news anchor back then was Dan Rather. And during the time of that war, Dan Rather would give his newscast and then at the very end of the newscast, he would say to all America, 
courage, good night. And what he was doing there is he was working as a media personality to encourage the country, to give the country courage, to give the country hope, to give the country steadfastness. And what it, and basically at that particular time, this may shock you, the media, the news media wanted us to have hope in our country, to have hope in the United States of America. And you know, indeed, to not hope comes with a warning. And there is a person who is not our persuasion who came up with this catchy phrase, and even though I don't agree with the purpose for which he wrote it, I agree with the sentiment, and it says this, democracy dies in darkness. And what it's literally saying is, when you do not have illumination, when you do not have hope, you will reach the end of what we know as democracy. And so now, what is so amazing to me is there is a stunning and concerted effort to remove the word hope from the American vocabulary. As a matter of fact, when our president says something hopeful, then the media goes, no, it isn't true. And when the president says things might get better, the media says, no, it's getting worse. Don't hope. Don't be encouraged. Don't be happy. Don't think things are going to get better. And so what happened is this week there was a testimony in Congress and a narcissistic, self-important man testified before Congress. This winter will be the darkest winter America has ever seen. And I'm thinking, hmm, you mean darker than Pearl Harbor and World War II? Darker than that? Um, darker than the Revolutionary War where our soldiers fought without having any decent shoes and trudged through the snow, didn't have warm clothing, didn't have pay, didn't have food? Darker than that? Uh, darker than the Civil War, when our Americas and brothers and sisters were taking up guns and swords and killing each other. Darker than that? How about um, our COVID epidemic? Or maybe I should point you back two years to the year 2018 flu epidemic epidemic only two years ago where it is recorded the cdc recorded 60,000 people died in the 2018 flu epidemic and they weren't even trying to keep careful track not like now where they try to find covid under a rock and they try to find presumptive cases and they try to they try to find presumptive cases of covid and they they to invent cases of COVID, anything we can do to get the numbers higher and higher and higher. This week, the state of Colorado got caught. They got caught, and it was noticed that they put down three deaths due to COVID for two, three senior citizens, and they had no proof they had the virus. Then they turned to a Native American man who drunk himself to death. His blood alcohol level was 0.55. 0 0.08 will get you arrested. 0.55. He died because he drank himself to death. But they discovered he had COVID, so they put it down as a COVID death. Well, Colorado got caught, and they made a correction. And they said, okay, we will no longer count people that we don't know they truly had the virus. And we will no longer count people who died with COVID. We will only count those who died of COVID. And their death number that Colorado has, the figure went down more than 20%. And so look at our present day figure and wonder what it really is if we get rid of the presumptive padding, and by the way, Oregon does pad our number with presumptive cases. I wonder what would happen if we, we got rid of 
um, those that died with COVID instead of those who died of COVID, if we separated those numbers, I wonder what the real numbers are. I wonder what the number of recovered people are. Don't you want to know that? Uh, let me give you a little statistics. Here in Umatilla County, 90 people, 90 people, one is presumptive, has got the COVID virus. 90 people. So now you know one is presumptive. So go down 89, okay? How many have recovered? Well, almost all of them. There's only 16 active cases in the county. So what in the world is going on here? Why are the numbers being padded? And why are the media pushing to try to make you think that everything is getting worse and that the fall is going to be the end of the world? Why are they doing that? Why are they making it so dark? Why are they trying to make you lose hope? It's like they are dipping paint in a bucket and looking at the blue sky and taking a paintbrush filled with black paint and trying to paint the sky black. They're painting it with their own brush. But I'm here to tell you, we are not them. Because the scripture gives God's people hope. And if you've trusted Christ as your personal savior, you have a great reason to have huge amounts of hope. As the Bible says this, but we are not of them that draw back unto perdition. And that means we are not of them that are headed toward destruction. We are not hurtling headlong to the end of life as we know it. We're not hurtling headlong. We're not trumpeting the end of the world, even though the world will end someday. We're not trumpeting it right now. It says we are not of them who draw back to perdition. We are not the ones that are going to tell people there is no hope. It says, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. In other words, we have a belief and we have a hope and we have a direction and we have a destination. And because of that, I've titled this morning message, because of what I see people doing and the media and the pundits and politicians of a certain persuasion doing, the title of the message is called this, A Brush with Darkness. Because what we have, by the way, just a second, trying to kill flies here. Oh, went away. <clears throat> a Brush with Darkness, because the reality is, is we need to observe some things. We need to come to the clarity on some certain points and we need to have a path ahead we need to understand what is happening and that this hopelessness so much of it is manufactured hopelessness because there is a hope but there is a reason why there's a promotion of hopelessness and you need to know it and you need to understand it and know what it means a brush with darkness let me give you three very important observations this morning, along with a bunch of other observations that are sub-observations, but still observations nonetheless. First of all is this. One of the reasons this is taking place, here's the first point, is there is the assumed advantage of darkness. There is the assumed advantage of darkness. What that means is there are those who assume and believe that darkness reaps a benefit or darkness reaps an advantage. Let me give you a few verses here. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> the book of Ephesians chapter 5, looking at verse 11. And the scripture says this, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So, one of the things that is assumed, the assumed advantage of darkness is that there are certain actions that are more easily committed in darkness. Think about it. Burglary, more easily committed in darkness. Statutory rape, more easily committed in darkness. Car prowls, more easily committed in darkness. Murder, more easily committed in darkness. There's this assumption that there are deeds that are easier to do, that are easier to accomplish 
in darkness. And so there's some people, they like it being dark because if they want to accomplish any of these evil things, they believe in the darkness, they can accomplish it better. Then there's also this. Look with me at John chapter 3. The book of John chapter 3, looking at verse 19. And the scripture says this. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Did you catch that? Men loved darkness rather than light. Because, there's a reason, their deeds were evil. And everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be approved. And so, for people with evil hearts who want to accomplish evil deeds, darkness is preferred. And so, what happens with this, you have to understand the process if you think about it. There is an assumed advantage to some people if all of America right now is kept in darkness. If everybody is kept in quarantine, if everybody is kept in ignorance, if everybody cannot interact with each other, if everybody cannot really find out what is going on, if everybody cannot really be able to tell or be able to get to the courtroom to even be able to speak of whether or not their rights are being trampled, if people can be led to believe by literally an endless onslaught, an endless media-driven and politically-driven onslaught that things are bad and that things are worse and whatever you do, don't have any hope. Because a hopeless people can be more dependent and a hopeless people can be more controlled and a hopeless people can be more manipulated. So there is an assumed advantage to the darkness and why some people say, let's keep the darkness going. Even when there's no reason. Even when the figures show all the cases are going down. Even when all the figures show the hospital cases are going down. Even when the figures show that people are recovering even when the figures show that people are getting better, even when the figures show that the virus is mutating and weakening, and that was found a week and a half ago, where 81 sequences were missing out of the COVID-19 genome they discovered in a patient, and it's a significant mutation, and somebody says, yes, that is the normal lifespan of the virus. Did you know the virus has a lifespan? A virus goes a certain way, and strong position and then it mutates and then it becomes weaker and the weak virus everybody gets because nobody knows they have it and then the weak virus helps everybody develop an immunity to the strong virus and the strong virus dies out this is why nobody's scared of SARS anymore because that's exactly what happened to SARS this is why nobody is as scared with H1N1 anymore why because that's what happened to H1N1. And that's what's going to happen to COVID-19. It's the normal, it is literally bare bones, 101 basic virology. But they don't want you to know that. Because if you knew it, you'd have hope. The assumed advantage of darkness. And to the point where it's even assumed that God himself is blinded by the darkness. Turn with me to Psalm 94. And this is what happens, you know, the Bible says this, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And what that means is you could say to somebody, you could say to somebody if you wanted to, they say, well, I don't believe in God. I said, well, why not? God believes in you. He actually wrote about you. He said, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. I, I don't recommend that you use that in the first step of a gospel presentation. But look at Psalm 94 and look at verse 3. And here's the question. Boy, we ask this question. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? 
How long shall they utter and speak hard things? And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine inheritance. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, catch this, the Lord will not see. Neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. In other words, they say, God can't see. God's powerless. God doesn't know what's going on on planet Earth. God doesn't know what we're up to. By the way, the devil says this all the time. God doesn't know what I'm up to. God always knows what the devil's up to. So here is the interesting thing. So it is assumed that even God is blinded by the darkness, that even God doesn't see what's going on. But it's not true. God does see. And we have proof of that as we look in God's word, uh, particularly looking at the book of Jeremiah, looking at Jeremiah, uh, chapter 23, verses 23 and 24. God has something to say about this idea that um, I'm not around or I can't do anything. Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24. He says, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? In other words, it's saying, Are you really, God is saying, Are you really trying to tell me that I can't be in two places at once? He said, are you really trying to tell me that if I'm in heaven, I don't know what's going on on earth? And if I'm on earth, I don't know what's going on in heaven? Are you really trying to tell me that I'm not around? You know, here's the thing. What's interesting is God is in heaven and God is in earth. God is in heaven where there is no darkness and God is on earth and he knows what's going on with this darkness. He is not ignorant. He is very aware. He's aware of the parties. He's aware of the people. He's aware of the demonic forces. He's aware of what the devil is doing because only the devil would shut down all churches in the entire world simultaneously. Only the devil could do that. Not even man can do that. Only the devil could do that. It is a great worldwide delusion, great worldwide deception. And God sees it. And the Bible says in Psalm 139, do you think we can take David's word for it? A man after God's own heart, a man who actually knew how God thought, a man who knew who, how God ticked, a man who knew how God operated. And he said in Psalm 139, verse 11, he said, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Nobody can pull the wool over God's eyes. But the assumed, they assume they have an advantage of darkness. But they don't. Because you know what? In him is light. So let me give you two more points here. First is the assumed advantage, but here's something that needs to be understood. For those that are lost, for those who do not know God, God will shine a spotlight of judgment. He will do this. In other words, while man's saying, God can't see me, and you see, man is like a little boy. Little kids used to do this, you know, you'd play peekaboo with them and say, you can't see me. And so a little boy will go like this. Little boy, little boy playing peekaboo will go, you can't see me. And this is what mankind is doing before God, saying, well, God, I don't believe you exist. Mankind is hiding his eyes from God and going, you can't see me. <clears throat> it's not true. God sees, and he shines a spotlight of judgment on the lost. First of all, if you're reading Psalm 94, we're going back to Psalm 94 and continuing that passage that we were reading a passage where the question was asked, how long will this go on? And God gives an answer about whether he can be seen or not, or whether he exists or not, or those who say he can't. And here's what he says in verse 8. Understand ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planteth the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen shall he not correct. And what he's saying is, if you are, if God is over there and he's dealing with evil in Zimbabwe somewhere, and you go and well, I'm glad he's dealing with evil over there. What makes you think he won't deal with evil over here? He will. He that teacheth man knowledge shall he not know. 
And so understand this. The Bible says that God will take notice. And as a matter of fact, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, looking at verse 3, it says this. The eyes of the Lord are in, oh wow, every place, beholding good and evil. God would be faster than me. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. God sees all of it. So God will take notice. And not only will God take notice, but those things that people think are in darkness and nobody will ever find out, the scripture says that God will reveal it. In Luke 8, 17, it says, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. In other words, there's nothing that stays underground forever. You know, a lot of the crazy and insane and corrupt things that have been taking place over the last three, three and a half years, they're all kind of meeting the light of day now. It's very interesting. And somebody goes, no, don't look at that. Look at the coronavirus. In fact, that's going to be what it all is now. No, don't look at that. Look at the coronavirus. That's going to always be the default position. Look at the coronavirus. God will take notice. God will reveal it. And then if there was any wisdom that Solomon learned by examining his life and looking for the meaning life, if there's one thing that Solomon learned, he learned something important about God. The very last verse of the book of Ecclesiastes says this, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In other words, God knows and he's shining a spotlight on it and nothing and nobody can get out of the way of the spotlight of God. Now that is for the lost. It's a spotlight of judgment. But God has something much better and much more hopeful for the born-again believer. And this brings us back to the very first verses we read at the beginning. And that is in the book of 1 John. I want you to turn there. Book of 1 John, chapter 1. And I want you to look at verse 7 because we're going to be here pretty much to the end of the service here. And it says this, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So for the lost, God will shine a spotlight of judgment. For the saved, God will shine a beacon of hope for his children. And even today, to this day, God shines a beacon of hope to you, the born again believer, and a beacon of hope with me. But first, he qualifies it. Notice this. First thing he does in verse 7, he says, but if, that if might as well be a mile wide and a mile high because that if separates hope from hopelessness. And that is, but if we walk in the light. And what it means is, but if we've chosen Christ, but if we've received Christ for eternal salvation, but if we've made choice to follow God but if we've made the decision who we shall serve and indeed this was the decision at the end of his life that Joshua challenged the entire nation with and he said this he said choose you this day whom ye will serve and then later he says but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord so for the saved it's a beacon of hope if, if you walk in the light. And by the way, if you walk in the light is a difference between salvation or no salvation. But let me also say this. If you're a born again believer, why would you walk in the dark? Why would you do the evil deeds? Why would you do the deeds of darkness? Why in the world would you do something that's going to create consequences in your life? And why would you want to do something that's going to take away your hope? If we walk in the light, God shines, becomes a beacon of hope. 
But then there's this wonderful description of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 5, 1 John chapter 1. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. So when you have a media that's trying to paint the sky black, understand all God is is light. And all that is around Jesus is light. There is not a hopeless day in heaven. Every day is a day full of light and hope. And this is the God that you serve. The God you serve is a God of light. He's a God of hope. He's a God of clarity. He's a God of righteousness. And he can shine a beacon of hope in your life even when somebody's out there with a big black paintbrush trying to paint your whole day and your whole night black. So understand that. Christ is the light. And then also understand this. And this is important. And this is why it is so wonderful to be a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. Because when you're a born-again believer in Christ, that means that you have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And what that means is I've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, and Kevin, having trusted Christ, has been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and Danelle, and Sharon, and Thomas, and Amanda, and Vic, and on, and on, and on. And you've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, the same Holy Spirit of God. Do you realize that the same Holy Spirit of God has the same attitude? Do you know God doesn't have a negative attitude? God has a positive attitude. God has a positive can-do attitude. God didn't sit there going, I really wonder whether I have the power to create the heavens and the earth. God didn't sit around and wonder those things. And understand that if this happens, Romans chapter 5, verse 5, is a very important verse because it says this. It says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad. It means all of a sudden, you know, somebody's trying to flick you with black paint, and God takes this very broad brush of hope, and he sheds his love abroad over all of you. And it says this, For the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And so, here's the interesting thing. We have a union of hope. Because through the presence of the Holy Spirit of God and through the person of Jesus Christ and through the promise of God, we have hope and we have a union with brothers and sisters in Christ and you can have a good day and I can have a good day and today in this church, in this service, assembling together, we can have a good day together. And what a wonderful thing that is because for the saved, God shines a beacon of hope. Why do you think the devil's trying to shut down the churches? Is it really rocket science? It's because if there's anybody on earth that has hope, it's God's people. God doesn't want us together. I mean, God, devil doesn't want us together. The devil wants us apart. And so the devil's just trying to do everything he can to keep us apart. But you know what? I count 25 people that are together this morning. And you know what? 25 people together makes a pretty good day. 25 of God's people together. It makes a pretty good day. And you know what? I bet if you have a good day, you probably could go out and make somebody else have a good day. That would be a good thing. And so we have a union of hope. But then here's the other very, very wonderful thing. In this day of pseudo-darkness. Hebrews 10, verse 14. And we talk about what Jesus has done and what it means. For by one offering he hath perfected forever. I like that term. Forever is kind of a long time, don't you think? He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before... This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And I love this. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Guess what? You are heaven bound with a clean slate. In other words, when you get to heaven, 
St. Peter's not going to be standing there with a, with a temperature sensor and a COVID-19 scanner. Okay, I'm checking. This is my sin detector. I'm checking for sin. You're clear, as will every born-again believer be, because Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ, wiped the slate clean. And so every sin that you ever committed and every sin you will commit, but don't do that, every sin that you will commit, Jesus has wiped the slate clean. Because you know what? What good would be a Savior who would pay for half your sins? No, he paid for all your sins. And so you have a hopeful destination and God, even in this day, shines with a beacon of hope and says you're on your way to heaven, the slate is clean, the price has been paid, and you have every reason to have a good day. So let's close with this. Still in Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Look with me at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And that gives the reason. For he is faithful that promised. In other words, you see, salvation isn't based on your faithfulness. Salvation is based on God's faithfulness. He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So what do you have with this full assurance of faith? Understand, we have an assurance. Number two, he is faithful that promised. We have a faithful God. And number three, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We have an assembly. <clears throat> and that is God's people. And so understand this. If you do not know Christ as your personal Savior, today would be a day to take care of that because Jesus will take care of your sins for all eternity. But number two, if you are saved and you look at everything that's going on around you, then do this. Just consider it a brush with darkness. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we look into your word today, and people talk about so many things that will expire and so many things that could die, and yet, Lord, you have given us a hope with no expiration date. And that is our hope through our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Satan has agenda. Satan has tactics. Satan plays mind games. But you are the one that is on the throne. And you are Lord of all. And at the last day, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So help us, Lord, as we go through these times, uh, what um, the Apostle Paul would call uh, a, a, a light affliction. But help us, Lord, as we go through it and help us to be the faithful that trust in you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us look in our gray songbooks and let us stand and look at 340 in this songbook. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And it is a chorus in this songbook. And let's sing this chorus through a couple times. And remember, if you look at him, nothing else is really quite so bad. So let's sing this 340. Let's sing it through. Twice. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of. 
of his glory and grace. Let's sing this one again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. If you're signed up for the 6 o'clock service, I look forward to seeing some of you at 6 o'clock. Those on Facebook Live, any of you can watch the 6 o'clock service uh, tonight. But uh, we're going to get through this. It's, it's going to get better. Uh, don't lose hope. Uh, go to McDonald's, and if they've got it open, sit at a table and order a Happy Meal and be happy. God's on his throne. God bless you. And uh, let me, I'll sign off to Facebook Live right now.